What's going on, guys? Welcome to episode nine of the Strength Matrix podcast. My name is Josh Selage. I am the BJJ Strength Coach. And today we're going to be talking about the number one way to get injured less on the mat. If you've been following me on Instagram or on YouTube or on TikTok or have seen me on any other podcast, I am always talking about that my number one mission in life is to help as many grappling athletes as possible win more matches and get injured less. And we're going to focus on the second half of that phrase and talk about the number one way, the best method, the the surefire the surefire thing that you can do to decrease your risk of injury and make sure that you get injured less. We're going to be talking about why using the tips in this episode are going to massively help you not only spend less time off the mat with injury, but also enhance your overall grappling performance and how you can you can begin implementing these things into your training schedule to help decrease your risk of injury. And plus, if you stick around for the end of this episode, I'll provide you with a bonus tip on how you can decrease your risk of injury. Before we move forward, I do want to let you know if you hear a little feedback or a little um, humming in the background, I have a little bit of an elbow injury. Uh, So this episode is quite ironic, but I have a little bit of elbow bursitis that's going on. So I'm currently running some red light therapy on my elbow at the time that I'm recording this. We're all, you know, friends and family and teammates here. So I hope you guys don't mind. uh, And please just disregard that small noise in the background. But before we move on, I also want to let you know that this episode, just like every other episode, is brought to you by thestrengthmatrix.com. And at thestrengthmatrix.com, we specialize in helping grappling athletes learn how to roll harder on the mat train smarter in the gym and equip them with all the strength and conditioning resources that they need so that they can go out and win more matches and get injured less and so if you're tired of all the confusion all the bs and all the misinformation that's out there about strength and conditioning specifically for jujitsu i want to invite you guys to click the link in the description below of this podcast episode and i want to hook you guys up with a free four-week strength program all you got to do is just click the link drop your name drop your email that free four-week strength program is going to get delivered to you automatically and that way you can take that free strength program and start getting stronger start working towards enhancing your overall grappling performance and start ultimately decreasing your risk of injury so without further ado let's go ahead and dive right into it episode nine the number one way to get injured less on the mat if you haven't guessed already the number one thing you can do to get injured less on the mat is to get stronger nobody ever got injured because they were too strong there's a very famous quote by someone that i look up to a lot louis simmons and he says that weak things break and he couldn't be more correct with that by getting stronger you help decrease your chances of sustaining injury on the mat in two different ways the first way is that getting stronger will allow you to increase your structural integrity and stability. So if you improve your ability to maintain good posture by getting stronger, you get stronger and are able to resist your opponent trying to fold you like a New York slice and you get stronger in the sense that you're able to resist outside forces that are trying to collapse your positioning. All those things are going to help you decrease your risk of injury. If you think about it, the only time you get injured is because there is an outside force that's on your body there's an outside force that's trying to break a certain structure and if that structure cannot withstand those forces it's going to break and that's what's going to cause injury a very simple example is just looking at your elbow in an arm bar the positioning of an arm bar and the purpose of an arm bar is to injure and break the ligaments and the bones within the elbow joint Now, if your elbow is strong enough to not be put in that position, so you're able to keep your elbow bent, you're able to uh, be strong enough with the rest of your body to move and apply the proper techniques to successfully pull off an armbar escape, you're not going to get injured in an armbar. However, if your ligaments and tendons and bones in your elbow are very weak, you may get injured in the armbar even if you tap early enough and fast enough and sometimes just even the strain that happens from training jujitsu and from rolling jujitsu even if it's not a direct submission can also cause injury there are times where i'm sure you've probably you know done some wrestling or or uh done some stand-up with takedowns you roll your ankle a little bit and then you're injured and you gotta take a couple weeks off the mat because your ankle's all blown up like a softball and the reason why that happened is because 
your body didn't have the structural integrity and stability of the ankle to prevent that from happening. So that's one way that getting stronger is gonna help decrease your overall risk of injury, and that's by increasing structural integrity and stability. This is why I am such a huge proponent of getting stronger being the number one thing you can do off the mat to improve your jiu-jitsu. Yes, conditioning is important. Yes, uh, nutrition and mindset and all those other things are very important, but the foundation is always gonna be built off of strength because if your body is not prepared to get better at jiu-jitsu physically and it's not physically resilient enough, you're really just asking to get injured down the line. And so focusing on getting stronger, focusing on building structural integrity, and focusing on improving overall stability across all the different joints, all the different muscles, ligaments, tendons, all that good stuff. Focus on building stability in all those areas is massively going to help you decrease your risk of injury on the mat. So that's the first way. The second way is going to be Getting stronger is gonna help increase bone density and specifically ligament and tendon strength. So when we talk about posture and we talk about maintaining posture, our muscles are going to work together with our bones to create a strong posture. Now, if our muscles are weak, it doesn't really matter how strong our bones are because the, the muscles can't hold the bones in the right position to maintain that structural integrity. So that's why we talked about having the act of getting stronger, increasing structural integrity and stability first. But as you're going through that process, as you're going through the process of lifting weights and getting stronger, your bones are actually gonna become much more dense. They're gonna get thicker, they're gonna get stronger, and the ligaments and tendons in your body are gonna get stronger as well. So. This is a big issue that I see with a lot of athletes that are super flexible and super mobile. They do a lot of yoga possibly, or they do a lot of stretching and mobility, but they refrain from doing any sort of heavy lifting or any sort of structured strength training. They will claim that like, yeah, I can move really well, I'm super flexible, and and all that stuff is great. I'm not, not trying to knock yoga or knock flexibility training, but at some point you need to load your body. At some point you need to do something kind of heavy because the benefits of that are going to help increase your bone density which is going to improve your overall structural stability as part of that process and it's going to help prevent more bone injuries or at least it's not going to there's no you can never 100 percent guarantee that you're not going to get injured so i want to be careful in saying that getting stronger is going to prevent injury because it will help decrease the likelihood of you getting injured, but it may not 100% prevent it. So um, I misspoke there and I I apologize for that. But increasing bone density is gonna help decrease your overall risk of injury. And then the ligaments and tendons, ligaments are the connective tissue that connect bone to bone, and tendons are gonna be the connective tissue that attach muscle to bone. And so a lot of times when people roll their ankle or uh, say they get their arm cranked on in an arm bar or a Kimura, a lot of times those ligaments and tendons surrounding that joint are damaged. And so if you're able to get stronger, able to start lifting heavy in a very safe and structured manner, not only is your bone density going to increase, but also the strength and the resiliency of those ligaments and tendons are going to increase as well. When you train for strength by adding an external stress stimulus to the body, and in this case, we're talking about lifting heavy weights, not only do the muscles get bigger and stronger, which is very helpful, but your bones get thicker and stronger as well. And studies have shown that the greater the bone density of an athlete, the less likely they are to sustain injury during sport. And this is across all sports, football, rugby, baseball, soccer, track and field, wrestling, jujitsu, MMA. It is so clear, at least based on the research, that athletes with the greater bone density are less likely to sustain injury in the future. And on the topic of bone density and getting stronger, This will also help improve ligament and tendon strength, making them much more resilient against high forces. If you're able to strengthen the muscles of your legs, not only will you be able to produce more force with your legs, and this often looks like being able to squat more, leg press more, etc., but the ligaments and tendons in your ankles, knees, and hips will also be more durable. So how do we go about building strength so you can decrease the risk of injury? It's important to recognize that there's going to be a a lot of different ways to skin a cat on this one. I get questions a lot on Instagram and I do my Q and A's a couple times a week 
uh, some people will ask, what's better, kettlebells or machines? What's better, uh, five three one or conjugate? It's like okay, like all those things are great. No single one of those is going to be that much better than the other. So when we look at kettlebells, when we look at barbells, machines, bands, all that stuff, all those things are tools. All those things are tools that we could use in a strategic way to build strength so that we can decrease our risk of injury on the mat. When we talk about different training programs like Jim Wendler's 531, or maybe you guys have heard of the app Strong Lifts, which is a, a little bit more typical 5x5 five five starting strength structured program. All those things are great, and those training programs are awesome, and they do have some benefits, but those also are tools, and certain principles from those training programs can be beneficial for jiu-jitsu athletes. Others, not so much, because those aren't really designed for jiu-jitsu athletes. Essentially, what we're going to look at when it comes to how do we actually build strength to decrease risk of injury, we're going to perform a mix of decently heavy compound movements and isolation movements for specific body parts. These exercises are going to work through a large range of motion, and it's important that while you're doing this, you're focusing on controlling the weight throughout the entire range of motion during the exercise. So a compound lift is a movement like your deadlift, your squat your bench press or floor press, your pull-up. It's an exercise where multiple joints and multiple muscle groups are working together to take your body through a certain movement. So compound exercise for the lower body, perfect example is a squat. A isolation exercise for the lower body is gonna be something like a leg curl. The squat is gonna engage your low back, your abs, your obliques, your glutes, all the tiny stabilizing muscles of your hips and your legs, your quads, your hamstrings, ankles, tibialis, all that stuff. An isolation exercise is going to be focused on just one particular muscle group. So, or sometimes maybe two muscle groups, depending on, um, say you're doing like a, a bicep curl. You have two different types of bicep muscles. You got your brachialis on the side, then you have your main bicep, which is that peak bicep muscle. If you're doing a bicep curl, it sometimes will hit both depending on how you're holding the dumbbell. But for the most part, isolation movements tend to really focus on one muscle compared to compound movements, which recruit a bunch of different muscles and are using a lot of a lot of those different muscles to take the body through a large range of motion. And then the other thing I want to touch on is focus on controlling the weight through the entire range of motion during the exercise. I heard a quote from Jim Wendler uh, while he was on another podcast, and I thought this was so freaking good. He said, your rep is your reputation. And what he was talking about was he coaches high school football athletes. And he said, sometimes these, these high school football athletes, they don't lock out their benches. They don't squat ass to grass. They uh, don't hold the weight at the top of a movement to gain control before starting another rep. And all in all, sometimes they just do reps that, for lack of a better term, just look a little trashy. They don't look, they're not doing it with, you know, terrible form per se, but they're just not upholding the highest standard of excellence when they're doing each rep. And he told his athletes, he said, look, your rep is your reputation. When you cut a rep short on a squat, when you don't come to a complete stop on a bench press, that's fine now, but eventually all those things are going to add up and there will be negative consequences for those things. And I think that's something very important to recognize. And some of the athletes I work with in person, there are some athletes that I try to encourage them to hold the weight a little bit longer at the top of, say, a Z press or a bench press or a deadlift. And the reason why is because we want to have control over the weight. We don't just want to move the weight from point A to point B. We want to control the weight from point A to point B. When you're doing jujitsu, anyone can just be a freaking spaz and try to knee cut past someone's guard. And sometimes that will work against lower belt levels or people who are less experienced than you. But if you try that against someone who actually knows what they're doing, you can't just spam and spaz your way past someone's guard. You have to establish control. You have to lock down their hips. You have to make sure that if you're in half guard and you're passing, you have to establish chest to chest connection. If you're an open guard and you're looking to Toriano pass, you have to establish strong grips. And strength training and specifically using free weights is very similar. You want to make sure that every movement you do, whether it's with a barbell, a cable machine, a dumbbell, kettlebell, 
everything you do is controlled. That doesn't mean you have to go slow. That doesn't mean you have to use a light weight. Those things aren't mutually exclusive, but you do want to have full control of the movement between every single rep and whether it's a really lightweight that you're doing for 25, 30 reps or something really heavy that you're only going to do one or two reps on, have control of the weight through the entire range of motion during the exercise. An easy way to test this and to see if you have control over a certain exercise or over a certain weight that you're using is just to uh, have a training partner call you out and tell you to stop at any moment during that exercise. So say you're doing a, let's say you're doing some t- a zercher squat, for example. So you're holding the bar in the crook of your elbows, you're doing a zercher squat. If you are just rushing through and you're bouncing your butt off the box and you're not having control, one thing that you could do as a training partner is say like, look, you're not having much control during this exercise. Let's see where you start to lose control. And so you, you know, your partner goes, they start pushing their butt back. You say, you know, stop. Are they able to hold that position? It could be just above parallel. It could be somewhere around parallel. It could be, um, if you're not using a box, you can dip below parallel and see like, Hey, can you control this weight in this position here? And if you can't pause at any point during a range of motion or during an exercise, that may be a sign that you need to focus on refining your technique and establishing better control of the weight through a full range of motion. And then next, training should consist of heavy lifting where you are you are in the zone of an intensity that is around 70 to 80% of your one rep max or maximum intensity for a given exercise. So if you know what your one rep max is on deadlift, you're really gonna get strong by lifting within the 70 to 80% range. There's a lot of different ways that you can go about this and that is a very big range. Can you go over 80%? Yes, absolutely. Can you go below 70%? Yes, absolutely. But for beginners, it's important that you try to stay within that 70 to 80% range of intensity. And then if you are doing something for, say you're doing 10 reps, not everybody knows what their 10 rep max is on a given exercise and that's totally fine so think of it on a scale of one to ten ten being like the hardest set you've ever done one being the easiest set you've ever done you want to keep things at a seven to eight intensity or difficulty for those higher rep sets um Higher volume sets and higher rep sets for isolation exercises are focused on increasing blood flow through certain body parts. So things like doing sets of 25 on banded tricep pushdowns, doing things like sets of 15 on bicep curls. Those are for increasing blood flow and local muscular endurance for those particular body parts. And then when you do your compound lifts, those are gonna be some of the ones that you would go a little bit heavier on in that 70 to 80% range. Things like your squats, deadlifts, benches, floor presses, all of that good stuff. So now let's discuss how you would actually begin implementing these things into your training week. I've talked about this in a couple other episodes and in a lot of different YouTube videos I've done. For most jujitsu athletes, doing strength and conditioning work two to four times per week is going to be that sweet spot for most jujitsu athletes. If you're a hobbyist and you're you don't really compete in jujitsu and you train jiu-jitsu maybe three, sometimes four times a week, depending on if it's a holiday week or something, you could probably handle doing about, you know, three, maybe four days of strength and conditioning work. If you're a competitive jiu-jitsu athlete at the highest level and you're training twice a day, multiple days per week, sometimes even three times a day, for you, you're doing so much mat time, you can really only handle about two days of structured strength and conditioning work. And so, we're going to be mixing in strength training to almost every day that we're focusing on strength and conditioning in the gym. So at least for my athletes and how I like to train them, there are some athletes that will do like, okay, this is just a strength day. This is just a conditioning day. But for, for the most part, most of the athletes I work with do some sort of strength work every day. The main reason being is because we want to spread out the volume of work and spread out the intensity across the week. If we go really hard, super, super, super heavy on our full body on one day, that's going to take a long time to recover from and that could be a little bit detrimental to our overall progress on the mat. So one thing I'll do is on one day, we'll go really heavy for the lower body and then we'll go really fast for the upper body. On another day, we'll go really heavy for the upper body and then go really fast 
for the lower body. And then on day three, we'll do a lot more higher rep, lighter weight sets where we're focusing on building muscle and increasing blood flow to the different joints that may be a little bit banged up. And so you can take that same approach when you're starting to develop strength to decrease your overall risk of injury. Say you're lifting about three days a week on day one, you're gonna say, okay, this is gonna be my heavy lower body day. I'm gonna pick one, maybe two compound exercises to do. So that could be like a squat, a split squat, a lunge, a deadlift, a um, good morning. I'm a huge fan of good mornings, which I believe I talked about in the last episode. But you're gonna wanna pick one, possibly two compound lift exercises. And you're gonna wanna stay within the four to six rep range. And if you're a beginner, doing two to three sets is probably a good place to start. And if you're an intermediate athlete, then you can potentially stay within the four to six set of four to six rep range. And there's a lot of variations in there that you can play with and continue to progress. But you wanna pick one or two main movements. After that, you're gonna wanna pick two to four accessory movements. And these accessory movements are all gonna be selected based off of your weak points. So say, uh, say your knees are really bothering you. It's like, okay, I'm gonna squat decently heavy, you know, do my four sets of six reps on squats. My next compound lift is gonna be a walking dumbbell lunge. So let's say I do three sets of five reps on each side. Perfect, that's awesome. I did my two compound lifts. Now I'm gonna pick two, maybe three isolation exercises. And my knees have been really bothering me and they've been in a lot of pain. So, okay, one exercise is gonna be a banded leg curl three sets, 15 reps. Another exercise is going to be a backwards sled rack. That's gonna be three to four sets, and maybe I'll do that for about 30 to 60 seconds per set. And then for the last exercise, I do wanna get a little bit of lower back work in there. So I'm gonna do back extensions and reverse hypers. Again, three sets, 15 reps. That's a very simple way that you could start plugging in and playing with how to design your own training program. Uh, if you're listening to this on audio and you're a visual learner like myself, it can be a little bit difficult to, to get a grip on, and that's totally okay. You can go to the YouTube channel, Setlet Strength dash the BJJ Strength Coach, and there's a lot of information on there about what type of movements you should be doing, what type of exercises, how many sets and reps you should do for jujitsu. And that's the basic structure of how we're going to implement strength training so that we can get injured less. And I told you guys that if you stuck around to the end of the episode, I'd be giving you a bonus tip on something you can do to decrease your overall risk of injury. And that's gonna to be to really focus on your mobility. Jiu-Jitsu is a contact sport. The entire point of Jiu-Jitsu is to grab one of your opponent's limbs or their neck and either bend that limb in the opposite direction or squeeze that neck so freaking tight you shut off all the blood to their brain. So there's gonna be a lot of stress and trauma that's applied to the body. And if your body is unable to move in the right direction, if your body is unable to move in the way it was originally designed to, it's gonna be very difficult for you to decrease your risk of injury. When I talk about mobility, mobility is different than just stretching. Mobility is a little bit different than, say, flexibility training. Mobility is, essentially, it's your ability to move in and out of a certain position, move into that position with control, receive force and or produce force out of that position. So in layman's terms, let's take the squat for example. If you have really good squat mobility, you have excellent control when you squat down into that ass to grass position. You can hold that ass to grass position, no problem. Another great benefit if you have really good squat mobility is that you can receive load in that position, which means you have a bar on your back, a bar in the crook of your elbows, like a zercher squat, or maybe you're holding a kettlebell, doing a goblet squat, you can receive load. And then the last test and the last definition of mobility is that you can produce a lot of force out of that position. So you can't just get crumpled in a squat like, well, hey, he, his ass got below his, his knees, but uh, he kind of fell over and blew his back out because he couldn't control the position. That doesn't mean you have good squat mobility if you could just dive bomb to the bottom of a squat. To have good mobility, you need to get into that position under, uh, under load or receive force from that position and do it while 
all while being in control and then you have to produce force out of that position so you have to stand up explosively with control that is the definition of mobility and so when we focus on mobility making sure that our hips are mobile our shoulders are mobile and we're doing all these different things on the mat when we have to move quickly when we get put into these funky positions our body is going to be resilient enough to accept and receive the load that's being placed upon it. A great example is, say you're a guard player. If you don't have very good hip mobility and you try to go inverted, that's gonna be very tough because your hips can't receive the load of your training partner trying to smash you. And that load is like, well, our hips can't handle it and your body's thinking, well, maybe we should put it into the low back because we can't handle it in the hips. We're just gonna push it up the stream and see if the low back can handle it. And let me tell you, usually your low back can't handle it that often and then you end up hurting your low back and you're out on the mat for a period of time. You guys know the story. Same song, same dance. So the bonus tip that I'm giving you guys is to really focus on your mobility. It's boring, it's not sexy. I understand, it freaking sucks, it takes time. And it is a little bit annoying when everyone's talking about, oh, you need to do more mobility, do more mobility. But I'm telling you, if you just take 10 to 20 minutes a day to focus on mobility, you will significantly decrease your risk of injury increase your potential to get stronger and massively improve your performance on the mat. This is something that's really important to me because I've had several uh, enormous injuries, at least I would consider them enormous injuries over the course of my wrestling and my jujitsu career. Injuries that I thought like, gosh, I, like, I'm freaking screwed. I may never be able to lift the way I want to lift again. I'm ne- I may never be able to do jujitsu in the way that I want to do it ever again. And the thing that led to those injuries was I was lifting and I was getting strong, but I wasn't getting strong in all the right places. And then the last thing that was contributing to me getting injured like that was I just had really poor mobility. I was walking around like uh, I, had about, I had the mobility of a trash can, pretty much. Now I could thankfully say I have the mobility of, say, a, uh, not a trash can, but I'm not, I'm not the most flexible guy in the world, but my mobility is pretty dang good at the moment, I will say. So focus on your mobility, 10 to 10, or I'm sorry, 10 to 20 minutes each and every single day. You can work on, you can work on different body parts. You can do full body mobility routines. If you remember within the strength matrix and you're part of the team, you do get access to over 25 different daily mobility routines that you can run through. They only take about 10 to 20 minutes to complete. It will be good for the day and you can move on from there. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. My name is Josh Settledge. I'm the BJJ Strength Coach. This is the number one way to get injured less on the mat, and that is to get stronger and work on your mobility. If you enjoyed this episode, if you learned something new, I'd really appreciate it if you guys could share out this episode with your training partners via Instagram, TikTok, text message, email. You can send a carrier pigeon with a piece of paper tied to its ankle with the link to this episode written out. That'd be you really a big help and i'd massively appreciate that you guys can follow me on instagram at joshua selledge and i'll catch you guys later peace